Right, almost the final session. <laughs> I've got the Fab Four with me along here. Um, so we, we, we've obviously listened a lot this, this afternoon about education and all the schemes available. And so the, the University have invited along a panel um, to see how education does filter into the, the workplace sector. And they're going to give us some insights into their um, findings and their ideas. And um, we're going to be probably 30 minutes of panel questions and then we'll probably have enough time for 10 minutes of open questions um, to ask as we go along. <coughs> so just a quick brief from me. I work for Raytheon Professional Services, which is part of the Raytheon family. Um, I work for European training part of the business. So I, I head up vocational learning apprenticeships, boot camps. I've got experience in the cyber boot camps as well um, for Raytheon. And yeah, I've been with the company 14 years um, and I was also an apprentice myself as well. So I've got a bit of experience there. And I'm going to ask now for my panelists to introduce themselves, tell us a bit about what they do um, and walk down the line. So if I start at the top, Peter. <laughs> Is the demand actually outstripping the potential supply? It's a good question. I would, I'd, the... the um what's the opposite of the word cynic the uh, the hopeful um, view is that, that it isn't in that yes I get your point technology is evolving the threat landscape's changing and you know at the moment it is doing that the, the gap is widening but I think that's because most of the people in the profession are from a very similar background and um, if we can change that inspire other people so women people from diverse backgrounds etc then we'll start to close that gap because the pipeline coming into the industry will be you know, much much broader. So I'm I'm hopeful, but it, it will be a will be a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Hi, my name is uh, Rahab, and I am a senior lecturer in industrial control in the engineering department, University of Bristol. So as engineer, uh, I am worried about uh, the security of uh, the new revolution now. You know, in the technology. Industry 4 and Internet of Things. Uh, in industry, we have number of uh, programmable logic controller and uh, robot. Uh, hello everybody, um, my name is Jonathan Elwood. I'm Chief Knowledge Officer for the IASME Consortium. Um, I'm also a visiting fellow of the University of Gloucestershire with a specialisation in um, knowledge management and um, neurodiversity. Um, uh, so the ISME Consortium is a consortium of uh, around about 300 uh, cybersecurity companies and um, within that are around about 800 uh, cybersecurity assessors which deliver various schemes um, with the UK government's chosen partner for delivery of cyber essentials in the UK and I'm also the scheme manager of the Civil Aviation Authority Assure Audit Scheme for the UK. Wow. <laughs> uh, so hi everybody, I'm Andrea Preston. I'm a pharmacist, a haematology pharmacist in Bristol, um, and I lead a team of cancer pharmacists and technicians. Um, and I'm here today to share my experience of the challenge of digital innovation in the NHS. Um, so I co-created an app for patients with a certain blood cancer called chronic myeloid leukemia, um, which we launched earlier this year, which has taken a long time to get from concept to launch, about seven years. Um, and also I'm currently doing a project looking at AI to improve the safety of prescribing systemic anti-cancer therapy. So, yep. <laughs> yeah. um, so straight into the questions. Um, Right, so panel questions first, then we'll have some open questions. So the first one we've got is, in the fast-moving field of equipping businesses, and I heard from a, a, an IT specialist that said every three years it changes. Um, so in the fast-equipping world of equipping businesses with the right skills, what specifically are the short-term and long-term objectives? I'm going to ask Andrew first on that one. Um, so obviously it's a different kind of, it's not corporate, the NHS. Um, as Mark said in his talk earlier, we have a clinical informatics hub. Um, and within pharmacy, actually, we have clinical informatics pharmacists. Um, I think a short-term sort of goal would be to help train those pharmacists. Um, they don't actually get any digital teaching, as Mark said. They're just passionate about it and then have got into that role. 
Um, personally, myself, like Mark, I've done the app in my own time. I haven't been paid for doing that. That's something I've done um, outside of that. Now with the AI project, that's um, we've got a research grant to do that. But I think short term, it's investing in those um, professionals who show a passion uh, for it. Um, and longer term is getting into the pharmacy undergraduate course. So our clinical informatics pharmacist is trying to do that, working with Bath University on their pharmacy degree to try and encourage it. I don't think it's um, being taken up too quickly because I think we're just, you know, in that clinical side. Um, but yeah, that, that would be an, an NHS. And obviously working then with the MSc that Tiago is doing, trying to just encourage that more collaboration really. Peter, what to add to that? Um, I mean, I think short short term, obviously, there's kind of lots of other sectors that are struggling with recruitment issues at the moment, and, and they weren't in that position even a few months ago. Um, so, I, you know, I think a big part of it is is actually that that upskilling of, of existing staff, and, and I think the point that was made earlier around um, having a lot of the team uh, in organisations having a certain level of cyber understanding uh, in order to sort of protect the, the, the business. Um, I think uh, longer term, um, it's, it's partly about actually, you know, working with uh, younger people coming into the sector, people who are retraining, wanting to come into the sector. Uh, and for me, it's some of the kind of demystifying. Uh, Kamal, I know, gets uh, will probably get frustrated with with uh, me kind of asking for a translation in, in terms of what's going on in in the cyber sector and what does that mean? What you know, what sort of skills do do, do, do people need to come into it? Because I think sometimes as as a a non-specialist, a non a non-tech specialist, sometimes that can be a bit of a barrier, uh, and it can be you know it needs that sort of translation to to attract people to the sector. Richards? And um, yeah, well, just just to add to that, in terms of the the long term objectives, I think there's been an increasing focus now with initiatives like Cyber First Schools and and others, the apprenticeship schemes, degree apprenticeships, and and, um, and excuse me, what have you? I, I think a lot of which we'll we'll come on to later, that are they're helping inspire that next next generation. So that's not going to fix the talent shortage we have today, but it will in the uh, the medium to to long term. And we're starting to see some really good traction, particularly in Gloucestershire as well, which can be very proud, actually, of what we've, we, we're doing in the county and how we're building, building that pipeline. And, and we're starting to, and we've still got a long way to go, to also reach people from more diverse backgrounds because that's going to be critical. And, you know, if you think uh, ahead to the challenges of cybersecurity as sort of threats evolve, we need people coming with new ideas, new and different ways of, of thinking. And to do that, we need to get a more diverse workforce. And that could be from a gender perspective, from an ethnicity perspective, from a neurodiverse perspective as well. Um, and so there's got to be that real focus on how we, we tap into people who traditionally wouldn't be uh, be interested in their career in, in cyber. So from your point of view, Jonathan? Um, uh, so, so when I look at the, I'm fairly new to the cybersecurity industry. And when I look at some of the job adverts quite often. Uh, the job adverts are requiring some pretty high level um, qualifications, many years of, sort of cybersecurity experience as well. So I think I'd like to see um, more entry level jobs, um, jobs that um, where people can just get a, a foot on the ladder, perhaps spend some time with those people who are more experienced and um, get some mentoring and guidership, guidance from um, from professionals that are seasoned in the industry. So, yeah, more entry-level positions. I think I'll, I'll just add to that as well. We're talking at lunchtime, it's the skills boot camps, and what people don't understand about them is the idea is we're supposed to design them with employers, and they're supposed to be vacancy-specific, but there is, there's been a definite disconnect between the two. But more and more that this becomes a mature policy, hopefully, obviously this was before all these changes, the more it becomes a mature policy, the more we identify that, you know, Andrea mentioned to me that she has a, she needs people to come into a job role that she needs to train into that job role. You know, a free four week program would be an ideal solution for that, that job role. Well, that's what a boot camp's supposed to be. Boot camps are, yes, there's qualifications that can be attached to them, but it's all about getting them the skills to get them into a job and get them running as fast as possible. Because obviously with a skill shortage, We've got to be mindful that we need people, but we also want to be productive. We want productivity as fast as we can to keep to keep ahead. So, 
again, if people are looking at boot camps, get involved if you're an employer as early as possible. Reach out to the university to talk to them because they do want employer involvement to design them for you. And that's the most important thing. They are meant for you, for your talent gaps. So really important there. Um, try not to get a little bit political with this one because this could mention the word Brexit. Um, obviously, from a, a tr from a, there's a balance of attracting talent from abroad and growing our own. Now, the idea around Brexit being probably being from the north, it's quite Brexit voting. The idea behind it was obviously to create more jobs for people that, that live here and stuff like that. Within the sector and lots of sectors now, there's a shortage because we, we haven't got that freedom of movement anymore. And just recently, we've, we've lost this freedom of movement, but we've got the ex-Prime Minister going to India to attract people over from India to come into the sector now. So again, it's like, what is the balance between attracting talent from abroad and growing our own? And I'm going to start at the, the end again with Peter on that one. <laughs> Drew the short straw on that one. Yeah. I? Um, I, I mean, I think th th there is no ducking it. Brexit absolutely has a huge, had a huge impact. Uh, and whatever people's political persuasions, it's, it's had a major impact and will continue to probably in some unforeseen ways in the next few years as well. Um, so, I, I mean, I think absolutely um, there aren't enough um, skilled people um, available at the moment to go into the sector. Um, so, you know, one opportunity is to recruit uh, abroad uh, from the, the, you know, the BRIC countries, etc. Um, and, and I think there's, there's, you know, a lot of um, uh, benefit to be had from, from that and, and from, from those linkages. Um, I think inevitably, though, we'd have to have pursue a twin track approach on it. Um, you know, I, I think the, the homeworking, uh, the kind of benefits of, of the, the change in, in, uh, in the acceleration of, of use of technology by a lot of organisations that weren't using it that much um, or that effectively before um, does create uh, the opportunity to have staff who are you know, either working elsewhere in the world um, and uh, working sometimes in different time zones to, to the kind of the main, the main business in, in the UK. Um, so I, I think it, 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 there is a real opportunity to do that, but it's got to be done alongside actually growing our own talent and, and having uh, businesses invest in longer term solutions for, uh, for having growing their own apprenticeships. Uh, I know, um, certainly from what David was saying earlier, that there are some some challenges about how some apprenticeships are viewed within within the sector, um, but uh, you know I think that that's definitely a route through. And, and you know when you hear the inspirational uh, comments from Nadia and others who've been through that that sort of route, I think it, you know it's higher and higher and uh, um, uh, degree apprenticeships are a, a fantastic way forward. As a as a parent who's shelled out however many thousand pounds for two kids going through the higher education system, um, I, I think it you know it, it appeals to a lot of parents as well. So I think there's there's a lot about twin tracking that about having some some local investment as well. So I'm conscious I've I've taken right, quite so a bit of time. I'll go to Richard next time. Um, yeah, I, mean, I agree with Pete said it's it's a both and <coughs> rather than than an either or. Um, but some of this is already happening. I mean, to give an example, you've got Microsoft, um, their, their, their security operations center for their Azure, their cloud platform. Clearly, that's a 24 by 7 service. They need to support that um, 24 four by 7 as well. And so they have three security operations centers in different parts of the world, one over in the States, one in the UK, actually, in, in Gloucestershire, and then and one in, I think it's in, in India. But so, so that this already happens within the industry that there's, that kind of collaboration across um, you know, nations and, um, and people from different different backgrounds. So, um, so there are models where it works, um, and I think we need to, to see more of, of that. Andrea, um, I, I swear I'm not in the digital industry as such, but um, yeah. yeah, I think what was interesting, particularly when we went out for the, we've got a PhD studentship with our AI project, and. Um, so I was involved in recruiting into that. And I was just really surprised that actually 75% of the people who applied were from abroad. So um, China, Botswana, you know, which really surprised myself. So, you know, when you're looking at growing talent from within or abroad, I mean, 
yeah, I don't know what the split is like in universities on courses, but um, yeah, and obviously from the NHS perspective, Brexit was awful in terms of losing lots of really talented um, members of staff. But. Is it, I mean, from your, yeah. in your role, have you seen a lot of this happening? Lot, last, lot, lot, loss of talent? To be fair, not so much pharmacy, but um, within the nurses um, and other, you know, frontline professionals and doctors, it hasn't affected us so much locally in our team. But yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, moving on to question three: mm -hmm. um, What role do you see for public-private partnerships, including working with schools and colleges, to ensure that no one is left out? And I'm going to ask Jonathan this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So. Um, Part of the ISB consortium is an organisation called the UK Cybersecurity Forum. Um, and since 2018, um, the forum has been running cohorts of training for unemployed neurodiverse people. Um, so that's teaching um, people who are already um, totally immersed in the subject matter um, some more cybersecurity, um, teaching them the foundations and supporting them with soft skills. Um, into employment. Um, so uh, currently we've uh, taught around 44 um, neurodiverse students um, and 26 of those have gone on into employment um, and around about 19 of those are employed in cybersecurity. Um, I'm one of them actually. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I think we've got to remove more barriers from inclusion into cybersecurity. Um, we have to look at lots of different minority groups. Neurodiversity is just one of them. Um, but there's, there are so many uh, minority groups who have talent um, who could fill that skills gap if we remove the barriers. And like Nadia said, I think put them in a position where they will take the risk, uh, take the risk of um, just taking the plunge, learning some cybersecurity, and um, just seeing where it leads, um, which is what I did when I was unemployed um, at, at the age of 48. Um, and I think, I think um, there's a lot more that we could do to make cybersecurity more accessible, um, to, to tap into the missed talents um, from lots of different minorities, especially neurodiversity. Just elaborate a bit, Jonathan, on your, you, you've gone from engineering to cyber, is that right? That's a, correct, a, yeah. A, yeah. The, as so, a parent, as so a... Yeah. In, my, in my role with the with the university, I, I've, I've got an engineering hat and a cybersecurity hat, so I'm quite lucky. But So I spent, <laughs> I spent a lot of years in engineering. Um, but, um, but yeah, I found myself unemployed and given this opportunity to learn cybersecurity, and I just took the risk, had a go, and... Um, and here I am, gosh. <laughs> On a panel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Excellent. Has anybody else got anything to add, add on that one? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to add a, a bit. I mean, public-private partnerships are um, yeah, vitally important across a number of issues in the, the cyber sector. We, yeah, it's not a, the skills gap isn't a problem that the education system can or should solve alone. It's not a problem that government should solve alone. It requires um, all three, industry, academia, and government to, uh, to come together. Um, so an example of this would be the Cyber First Schools Programme, which is a national cyber security centre initiative focused on inspiring the next generation. So going into schools, helping schools and supporting schools and recognising schools that have a strong provision in terms of computer science and, and cyber. Um, but then crucially, it's about the um, industry partners from the cyber security sector going into those schools, providing role models providing activities and um, helping lead code clubs or activities, things like that, that, that really bring it to life for, for the kids and get them excited about the possibilities of the future in the, in the industry. And it's uh, taking that partnership approach that's, uh, that's been crucial to the success of that program. Can I just add a couple of points, David? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the, the, the other things I'd add really are, um, I think, you know, you're sitting in a place where, where there was, uh, uh, a drive to, to kind of link up public sector, private sector um, uh, provision um, and, and funding. So um, I, I was just doing a quick tot up uh, before I came up to, to sit up here. You know, Gloucestershire um, Chief 
LEP has actually invested about 31 million um, of, of public money into um, cyber related projects in the county over the last few years. Uh, and if you um, then lever in a lot of the, the private sector investment that, that we've been able to, to do so with that, you know, that, that for me is a good example of, of actually uh, public private sector working together and actually sort of driving, driving change. So, you know, three million invested into, into this place uh, as, as an example. Um, the, the other thing I would say is please don't forget the voluntary community sector as well. Um, so there are about 4,000-ish uh, uh, voluntary community sector organisations in Gloucestershire operating. Um, a lot of those actually reach community groups that um, other, other parts do not reach, to paraphrase a, 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 an advert. Um, and, and so there are actually you know, an opportunity for them as organisations to become more cyber um, cyber aware and cyber skilled uh, and there's also you know their reach into into communities to, to pick up on on, on the, the point uh, really around you know reaching you know reaching other communities I mean I, I, I think I'll have the final point on it I was at a cyber first event and it computer science is still not reaching every school you know 22 I think it's 22 percent of schools still can't offer computer science in this day and age is quite shocking I think, and I, I, you know, I, I run a little code club, code the dojo stuff, and when you've got students coming to you asking you to, you know, to, to write an appeal letter for schools because based on postcode they are not going to get the place that they want, it's, I think is quite tragic. Um, luckily, the two that I have done this year on that basis did get the school that they wanted, but capacity level they might not have got that opportunity. And these were two girls as well, obviously, we're trying to get more girls into the, to the industry. Two girls there by postcode were not going to get computer science at GCSE level. Mm -hmm. So again, there's lots of groups that we've got to target and stuff like that, but it's also, we need to be really all of us lobbying local areas and schools, you know, and the, the local MPs and stuff like that, because I think 22% that can't offer computer science is just, Damaging future, you know. We, we've got this skills gap. There's a there's a gap there already. You know, there's, there's, we can fill it there. Okay, moving on to question four. Um, with the government's got lots of initiatives. Okay, we, but I'm going to amalgamate this question a little bit with flexibilities as well, guys. So just bear with me. <laughs> so I'm just looking at the time. So there's lots of initiatives out there. There's apprenticeships, there's boot camps, there's technical qualifications, there's all stuff going on, there's the cyber first. How helpful are these initiatives to bridge the skills gap? That's the first part. And then the second part is, what more can we do with those, those skill systems? I'll go to Peter, he'll try to understand that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I I mean, I think the overall answer for me is that it is a positive thing uh, because, uh, you know, certainly what Rashid was saying earlier and, and what other colleagues have said uh, during during the day is that, you know, we need different routes into the sector. We need different ways of, of gaining those skills uh, over different time periods. Um, uh, and in order to, to kind of get the number of new staff that, that, that we need, uh, we need to do that in a very flexible way um, that actually suits different people's life stages, different people's personal circumstances. So I, I think the, the kind of mix of having or having a mix of different routes in is actually really important. Um, what the flip side of that, um, and uh, just to say a, a big thank you to, to Charlotte and, and Kerry Ann, who are kind of trying to navigate this and actually try and simplify this um, for a lot of young people coming through the system, is you know, well, how how do I you know know which which way is is the right way into this, uh, or if I'm you know career changing, um, you know, how do I know what 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 my route is, and actually that translation and that kind of clarity around how do you get into the sector and and what other pathways both into and within the sector, I think does need some more work. I know there's a lot of work going on on that. Yeah, that follows on really nicely to the point I was was looking to make there, which is around the, the UK Cybersecurity Council. So, relatively new national body that's been uh, funded initially by, by DCMS in, in government to do exactly that, to provide um, clarity over the pathways into the industry, to be that national body representing the, the sector from a professionalism point of view, um, and also to elevate the profession um, so in the same way that you know the legal profession or the medical profession has a very clear sort of body that represents it, clear pathways into it, and um, that's recognised, and, and, and most parents would 
you know, want to encourage their, their kids to go down that route if it was something they were interested in. We, we're finding with cyber it's less the case, you know, parents, some parents anyway, don't see it as having the same level of prestige or opportunity as those other, other um, professions and, and that's what the UK Cyber Security Council is there to, to address. So, um, so I think we are starting to, to see that. Um, it's, it's a new organisation. The website has got 16 pathways into the sector and I know they're doing work with industry to, to help refine those and, and improve on them. But I do encourage anyone, if you haven't already, to, to check that out and it, it's a good sort of starting point for routes, routes in. Jonathan? Yeah, I think it's very interesting. I think the UK Cybersecurity Council is going to be a, 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 a really good um, professional um, gateway into, into the industry. Um, I'm hoping to work with them myself to, to um, discuss my personal ambitions around um, neurodiversity to make it inclusive, to make sure that there's no barriers there for the UK Cybersecurity Council um, in terms of, you know, does is the criteria for becoming a, a professional through that avenue um, uh, have restrictions, for example, uh, must be able to talk in front of an audience. Um, that would, uh, you know, those, those yeah. sorts of things have, have, have got to be, in my opinion, got to be um, relative to the, 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 the discipline that they're talking about for that professional qualification. Um, but also I'd like, I would like to see more funding for opportunities for getting more minorities um, in, into the industry, really. At the moment, our funding for neurodiversity training uh, is purely in Worcester. It comes from the DWP. Um, it's, um, the, the, the scheme works, it's successful. Um, if we could have some of your 31 million, that would be... <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, the government's challenging elsewhere. Oh. So, well, it might change tonight, you never know. <laughs> Andrea? Yeah, I think I'd just like to add, I wish there were more opportunities created for clinicians as well to do some of this kind of learning, because um, we know what the problems are and you guys could come up with the solutions, so collaborating, and not that we need to <coughs> learn to, you know, the expert level that you guys know, but... Um, you know, it's opened a whole new world to me just um, with the app and the AI project and, yeah, just more collaboration. I think Tiago can talk a bit more about the MSC, that that's being opened up to healthcare professionals to, to do a very project-based uh, learning. Um, but, yeah, it'd be great to see more opportunities created because I think, you know, getting clinicians engaged in the projects is really important to make sure the right projects are done, not think, like co big corporate companies might think they know what the NHS wants and needs, but we need to, you know, it needs to have that clinical input, really. And, and I can say, sort of speaking as someone who used to <coughs> run a, a sort of cyber and digital business back in the day, um, being able to do that, talk to, you know, clinicians or the, the end users and actually understand the challenges and is, is mm. yeah, very, very important. And, uh, and you'd be pushing against a, an open door with that. So, and it's great that the university can help bring those sort of two um, sectors, if you like, together. I think obviously I mentioned skills boot camps and how they need more employer engagement. Apprenticeships, obviously, I'm fiercely passionate about them, but they are very complex when you explain it to a parent. Obviously, it's you've got to find them a job. They've got to go and get a, They've got to go and be assessed. They've got to have an interview. You've got a long process to get there, and then the employer might just change their mind or not recruit anymore. So obviously, university can offer that more slicker route to education. So although you know. That, completely endorsed with what Nadia was saying earlier, it's it's a great opportunity. It's also one of the hardest opportunities to get. You know, it's it's the digital sector's not doing enough of them. It's still there is still a bit of a snobbery around it that it's you know it's more for an outdoor industry or it's an automotive industry as engineering. I think one of the great things the government did was put that money in the employers' pockets because that has made them think a lot more and it is changing. And they are talking about it. But I think with a European perspective that I have, I've got a French equivalent, I've got a German equivalent, and they have a system in France, for instance, the levy is attached to the person, not the employer. And the levy can then go on a university course, or it can go on a boot camp, or it can go on a accredited course. You, and you accumulate a value of, of that levy. So I think the government said a while ago, in the last budget, I believe, that they are gonna look at the levy and I think that might be something that they might be looking at, saying, well, what's the other way of using this apprenticeship levy in a more adaptable, slicker way that makes it a bit simpler? Because 
the friendships are fantastic if you get them. Absolutely brilliant. No debt, you're funded, you get degree level qualifications, but there's a lot of people that it's a long road to get that opportunity. You know, there's a lot of a lot of tests to go through, a lot of applying, lots of hunting. And in some areas there won't be jobs available, etc. So so yeah, hopefully with the levy it's you know it's a great tool out there, for those that understand it. Um, but the more they make it slicker, the better, I think. And I'm going to, it's going to be the last panel question. Um, what further action should business be taken now to better prepare themselves for the current and forthcoming security de demand? So obviously hearing today um, what's, you know, what's coming up in the future and how quickly this sector is moving. So what are the top three items on your critical checklist for businesses? Um, I want to go Richard first this time. Um, yeah, sure. I wouldn't say necessarily have a... a, a top three items on a critical checklist and very much depends on the type of business you are. I think if you're a, a large business um, and you haven't already, then I think at the top of that list has to be having cyber security as a, a board level issue. Um, so cyber risk and risk management needs to be very visible at the board and you need to have somebody on the board who is responsible for, for cyber and cyber security within a business. Clearly, the smaller the business is, the less likely they are to have those sort of you know, big, big boards, etc. But they will still need to have somebody um, senior within their organisation who appreciates and can take responsibility for for protecting their their business. Um, and um, and then I guess in terms of I guess three areas to focus on. I suppose from a technology perspective, there's sort of three. Well, the probably not even emerging technology. The technologies that are kind of here and now. And we've heard um, mentioned already AI and machine learning and that increased automation. And um, that's clearly um, having has a cyber security impact. And um, so businesses that operate in that space need to make sure they're aware of, of that and how it's evolving and the threats and opportunities that it can bring. And um, similarly, I guess, further down the line with quantum computing, we're probably not that far away from um, from that becoming more and more usable and applied in the real world. Um, and so that's something, again, if it's going to be relevant to your business, then you need to be aware of that um, and then I suppose the other one is the kind of hyper connectivity you get with the you know internet of things and, and more and more devices being uh, deployed and connected connected up again if your business is either utilizing IOT technology or is in an environment where that exists again being aware of, of the threats and impact that that can bring is, is going to be important. So and you Jonathan? Uh, yeah this is an invitation to have a shameless plug really. Um, <laughs> we, we talk to business um, every day um, and it all depends on who we're talking to. Um, if, if we're a, an SME or if we are talking to uh, maybe a larger organisation which wants to protect their supply chain, we have to pick the right tool which would be cyber essentials. Um, in terms of operating at maybe a board level, um, ISME uh, Cyber Assurance um, you can download free templates on, from ISME Cyber Assurance, which give you um, uh, cyber incident response um, templates and um, um, playbooks and uh, policies and things like that, which can help SMEs. Um, but also we do operate at national infrastructure, and we are here talking about national infrastructure at the end of the day. Um, so if we're in a national infrastructure scenario, we would be looking at the uh, cyber assessment framework and talking to our high level cyber security professionals to deliver cyber audit for the cyber assessment framework. Excellent. And I think obviously we're looking at the skills gap we've got. I think the three critical items on your list need to be more people more people and more people. <laughs> we just need to start recruiting because it's the amount of businesses that are waiting for something to happen before they're going to do it, it's frightening. It will happen. It will, as it said this morning, I think it was 15% on your, on your share price in 10 days of having a cyber breach um, came out today. And it's like, well, if you equate that to your business, you know, if you've not got someone doing that job daily, monitoring it, you could lose 15% of your business in 10 days. And if it's going to take you 200, I think it's 300 days or something like that to, to actually fix it, it's, it's, it's a problem you know is going to happen. So it, it'd be worth thinking about it now and, and dealing with it. So that's, that's my final piece on that. Um, it's open questions. So obviously we've got, I think we've got 
Yeah, we've got eight minutes. <laughs> open questions, to be precise. That's a question. Yep. So it's uh, Neil from G First um, LEP. Um, I wonder, actually, is this is this problem unsolvable? Is, is the demand actually <laughs> outstripping the potential supply? It's a good question. I, I, the the um, What's the opposite of the word cynic? The uh, the hopeful um, view is that, that it isn't, in that, yes, I get your point, technology is evolving, the threat landscape's changing, and you know at the moment it is doing that, the, the gap is widening. But I think that's because most of the people in the profession are from a very similar background, and um, if we can change that, inspire other people, so women, people from diverse backgrounds, etc., then we'll start to close that gap because the pipeline coming into the industry will be yeah, much much broader. So I'm I'm hopeful, but it, it will be a will be a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Next question. My name is Rehab, and I'm a senior lecturer in industrial control in the engineering department, University of Westminster. So as engineer, uh, I am worried about uh, the security of uh, the new revolution now. You know, in the technology. Industry for on the Internet of Things. Uh, in industry, we have a number of uh, programmable logic controllers and uh, robots. So all these are uh, programmed, and so anybody can access to the program and maybe make a disaster for this company. Mm. For this reason, uh, uh, is there is a branch in cyber education focus on the uh, cyber security for physical systems or? or and I, I agree it's a it's a big risk area and we've already seen sort of um, I think it was a couple of years ago a dedicated denial of service attack based on I think it was security cameras that were were triggered because of weaknesses in their their, their security and I, I think from an education perspective I, I, I'm aware that there are courses that either offer as part of their um, syllabus focus on the sort of cyber cyber physical um, I think there may even at master's level be specific courses um, purely on that um, but there is also legislation I, I can't remember if it's gone through recently or is in the process of going through the house around called secure by design which is actually for the manufacturers of IOT devices to, to um, in, uh, be forced to regulate um, the fact that they have to implement particular security standards to avoid the what we have at the moment, which is, you know, with a lot of those IoT devices being sort of open to, uh, wide open to attack. Could I uh, just jump in on this one as well? So, um, yeah, there are, um, I'm not sure if it has gone through legislation or not, there's also uh, one which is done by Etsy. Um, we've uh, developed a scheme called IoT uh, Cyber Assured. Um, and really this is about uh, consumer uh, protection so when you buy um, an Internet of Things device from Amazon, you know, how do you know by design that it is secure? So we have a, we have a scheme which you can um, get your products accredited and badged so that the consumer can buy those and know that what they are buying is configurable to be secure by design. So um, check out uh, the ISME website, um, look at IoT, and um, you can download the uh, question set, a criteria, and you can have products assessed and, um, and have them validated as being secure by design um, via IASB and one of our cybersecurity specialists. Because we had the event, big event in our campus uh, two years ago, mm -hmm. and a very famous international company uh, came to our campus to show us their products. And uh, they are very scared to call the cyber <laughs> the, the attack because they have robots. Yeah. They wear uh, PLCs, a lot of PLCs, so anybody can access to the program of these PLCs uh, and they use it so that for the, so they said they are a little bit worried about using the Internet of Things and the industry for uh, and the new technology, especially the customers. Maybe. Yeah. But this is the, the fundamental problem with, uh, in terms of national infrastructure, isn't it, where PLCs can be accessed and, and shut down a pipeline in America. So, um, you know, uh, Kevin T was talking about this earlier. There is a, a massive shortage for those, those specialists 
that, that can specialise in um, operational technology, industrial control systems, and you know the, there's only a few people in the country who can do this. So this is where we do need to focus some of our energy. You know, build build a train training. Um, you know, we have the specialists. We need to get the knowledge out of their heads, build those courses, accredit them, and get more of those professionals who can actually protect that national infrastructure. We've probably got time for one more question. So, go ahead. Um, I have this um, interesting thoughts and it's one, um, more of geopolitics. And, you know, we are, um, we are moving into cyber warfare now. And, um, you know, in other countries, which is not normal countries, it's like um, cyber security specialists is a spy for them. And they are arrested every now and then. They have huge, I met a lot of them, like, um, they are being arrested and they are been like the same for years there. And how you are going to prepare and create a cyber uh, cyber education for tomorrow to equip those students or specialists in dealing in such events that they have in, in their lives? Good question. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think Richard wants to answer this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a face that says I don't want yeah. to answer that one. Um, that, that's, that is a really tough question. I don't think I have an answer. As in, how, how do you prepare somebody for, you know, the, for that scenario where they're, they, they could be you know, persecuted, essentially, for, for, uh, for applying their skills? Um, I honestly don't know, because we're very fortunate in this country where we, we're not, not at threat of that. So it's something we perhaps take, take for granted. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I genuinely can't offer an answer to that. So I'm very, very sorry. Um, <laughs> Maybe Kamal can answer that. If well, I think he might know. no, I can't. But <laughs> um, I was just thinking, that's not very dissimilar from being a journalist. Yeah. If you can be detained, and we have cases of journalists who are who have been detained overseas for applying their skills. Mm. So it's about that awareness, uh, what your role entails, what you do with it, and from. As part of the course, there's an ethical dimension anyway. Because these students, these learners who are learning ethical hacking, for example, they can use the, the skills for the wrong uh, applications. So from an education point of view, we make sure that you get the ethical dimension. But I'm afraid when you go to the outside world, it's like any other discipline. Sorry, I don't have any better news for you. <laughs> Right, that's the panel over. Well, thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you.